What's up, YouTube? This is 82 and 0. Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about Connie Hawkins, one of the greatest players you probably had never heard of, or maybe you have. I'm here to tell his story. Uh, one of the most forgotten players in NBA history, a series of unfortunate events robbed him of his prime, and who knows how good he would have been if he got to play in his prime. You know, so he was born July 17th, 1942 in Brooklyn, New York, and he grew up extremely poor in Brooklyn because he was raised by a single mother who was blind. So his mom couldn't work, you know, a lot of good jobs being blind, having to raise her five kids. And Connie Hawkins was in a lot of trouble growing up. Uh, he started drinking at an early age, smoking. But once he discovered basketball, this became his escape from poverty, from alcohol. And he completely focused all his energy into the basketball court. And it was his junior year of high school that he began to devote himself to the sport. And he quickly became a Brooklyn basketball legend on the blacktop. He's one of the best-known streetball players of that era. And when he graduated from high school, he uh, there was a whole bunch of colleges who wanted him, you know, because of his great athleticism, his gracefulness in the air. He had a great vertical leap. He had one of the biggest hands in NBA history. You know, a lot of times we hear about Boban or Shaq's hands, you know, but Connie Connie Hawkins was only six foot eight, but his hands were ten point five inches in length and eleven inches in span. So he had some massive hands, kind of kind of like Michael Jordan. You know, I think Michael Jordan had similar size, but so he chose the University of Iowa in 1960. And the rule at the time was he had to spend a year on the freshman team, and Iowa students got to see Hawkins in action. He did not disappoint. After one year, though, everything came crashing down before he could even really get a chance to, to start. Now, before Hawkins' first season at Iowa, he occasionally had taken money from a former NBA player named Jack Malonis. And he himself had been banned from the league after a point shaming scandal. And in 1961, authorities brought down an extensive college basketball point shaving ring mastermind by Malonis. Now, the tough part is Hawkins only borrowed 200 bucks from... Malonis, you know, I think it was in the summer he borrowed 200 bucks from him. But they didn't see it that way. They saw it like, you're point shaving. You took money from him. Even though Hawkins paid him back and whatnot, you know, it was just a loan of money. They didn't look at it like that. So they threw the book at him. And... You know, this has always been a reason why I kind of don't like the NCAA. Is they make all this money off of these these poor kids. You know, millions off of them, really. And they don't pay them anything. I know, I think recently they started changing this, but they make all this money off of them. And some of these kids, you know, I'm not justifying point shaving, I'm not. But some of these kids, they need money, all right? They don't come from money. And sometimes you're desperate. Like Connie Hawkins, he took a $200 loan. He didn't point shave, but they threw him out of college. Uh, they threw him out of college basketball. And Hawkins found himself back in New York being questioned by law enforcement officials who pressured him into... A confession. Hawkins was excel expelled from Iowa, and then he went undrafted in the NBA. It was a blackballing that no no team wanted him. 
You know, it's sad. So what did Hawkins do during his prime years? Well, he would have been drafted much sooner, but he would then go on to play with the Pittsburgh Wrens, which I'm sure a lot of you have never heard of. Now, in the early 60s, Abe Saperstein tried to form a basketball league. He called it the ABL. And, you know, the ABL, it was it was there. You know, it was the first league to implement a three-point line. They had a lot of other weird rules, like a 30-second shot clock. Um, the free throw line was 18 feet. Instead of the standard 12, or the free throw lane, I mean. So he played for the the Pittsburgh Wrens of that league. And he, w- uh, he was named to be the most valuable player in that league. Although the league itself disbanded and it folded after like one or two years. And it was in the middle of the 62-63 seasons. So Hawkins then spent the next four years performing with the Harlem Globetrotters. During this time, Hawkins was traveling with the Globetrotters. He filed a $6 million lawsuit against the NBA, claiming the league had unfairly banned him from participation, and there was no substantial evidence linking him to gambling activities. Uh, And fortunately for him... uh, there was a new basketball league being created around this time called the ABA, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. And he would join the Pittsburgh Pipers of the inaugural 1967-68 and ABA season. Now, his best years were with the ABA. Now, I think a lot of people who grew up in that era remember him for the ABA years. Uh, his numbers were just ridiculous in, in the ABA. So he was a 25-year-old rookie with the Pittsburgh Pipers, and he led them to the first ABA championship. They defeated the New Orleans Buccaneers in seven games, and this would be Connie Hawkins' only championship. And for that series, Connie Hawkins actually had a pretty decent series. He averaged 30 points and 11 rebounds. So he was also, you know, one thing that I think gets forgotten about him was how good of a rebounder he was. His first year in the ABA, he put up 26.8 points per game and 13.5 rebounds per game, 4.6 assists per game. He was very well-rounded, and he won the most valuable player of that year, and the finals MVP. So, you know, the following season, the Pittsburgh Pipers would move to Minnesota, and they weren't able to replicate the same success. Now, following this, his suit, he would end up winning. And his lawsuit would be a success, and in the 1969 he would uh, be able to be drafted. Now, they successfully cleared his name, and he would join the Phoenix Suns for the 69-70 season. And what's uh, crazy about that is, so in 1969, they held a coin toss, Phoenix and Milwaukee, and... Milwaukee ended up getting the number one pick, and they chose Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So he could have potentially played for the Bucks, Connie Hawkins, but it was the Suns who got him. Now, he had a pretty successful career with the Suns. He averaged 20.5 points per game, 9 rebounds per game, 4.3 assists, 1.4 steals, 1 block over the next 5 seasons. And his Phoenix Suns weren't able to really get any playoff success. Um, You know, they had years, for example, like 72, where they won 49 games, but they they didn't make the playoffs. So, they didn't have a lot of success. 
And, you know, this has always been something on my mind. What would Connie Hawkins have done had he got to play in his early 20s or his prime, you know, in the NBA? Because during this time, like especially towards the end of Connie Hawkins' career, after he'd go to the Lakers, uh, he would actually be traded to the Lakers for Keith Erickson. And he started battling injuries when he was playing with the Lakers, you know, and it really robbed him of, of a lot of his athleticism. So he missed 11 games due to injury in the 70-71 season. And by 71, 70, uh, by 73-74, I mean, however, you know, he was just a shell of himself. And by the 75-76 season when he was on the Hawks, injuries limited Hawkins' production in the 74-75 season. He finished his career after the 75-76 season playing for the Atlanta Hawks. And he was just having really bad knee problems. And this is why he retired early. But, you know, what if he started playing in 63 or 64? You know, this guy could jump out of the gym. He was the Julius Irving of his time, you know. And he was a great defensive player, you know, great scorer, great rebounder. One of the best all-around wings we've ever seen. You know, he was a great passer, great shot blocker for his position. So I think he really got robbed because he probably could have won a championship maybe. Who knows in the NBA? Or an MVP maybe. You never know. And, And this is also showing... How many other players are what-if stories? How many other players, due to circumstances, couldn't reach their full potential? You know, and it's really unfortunate that Connie Hawkins was robbed of this career over a $200 loan that he took. He didn't engage in any gambling or any loan sharking or any point shaving. So... Let's talk about his career. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1992, and he's actually the first Phoenix Sun to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, He's a five-time All-Star, 1968 ABA champion, 1970 All-NBA, two-time All-NBA, two-time All-ABA, 1967-68 ABA MVP, and he's on the ABA All-Time team. And... He was probably, in my opinion, the most underrated player of the 70s. And, you know, there's a lot of narrative now, you hear nowadays, when people say players of the past, they couldn't dribble with their left hand, they they weren't fundamental. And to me, this is ridiculous because if you look at Connie Hawkins, right, you got to understand the rules back then. They were a lot stricter in the NBA back then about what you could do with the ball, like your dribbling, right? And Connie Hawkins, if you watch him in the ABA, because the ABA was a little more relaxed with their dribbling rules, he had great handles. Or if you watch his, you know, because he was a famous street baller, right? He, uh, he had... In, Crazy, crazy handles. You know, this is what pisses me off when people say ball handling is like something new. You know, that's a fundamental of the game that's been around a long time. And unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He passed October 6, 2017. He battled cancer. He was only 75 years old when he passed. So rest in peace, Connie Hawkins. Let me know what your thoughts are down below. Thanks for watching.